Welcome to this inaugural science event at the Wheeler Centre in association with Science and Technology Australia. Um, tonight we'll be talking about the hot topic of immunisation as Ebola rages across Western Africa. So immunisation, what to do when the science isn't enough. My name is Upli Divisekra and I'll be your host tonight. And we'll be discussing some of the issues around immunisation, public health, infectious diseases. And afterwards you, the audience, get to ask us some questions. So, I'd like to introduce our panel of eminent experts for tonight. Uh, at the far end there is Professor Anne Kelso. Anne Kelso is Director of the World Health Organization Collaborating Centre for Reference and Research on Influenza. And this is one of five centres around the world that are involved in updating the influenza vaccine every year. And they monitor the viruses and how it changes uh, over the year and actually supply the viruses for the vaccines. Uh, in the middle, we have Associate Professor David Sharkey. Um, David is at the Research School of Biology at ANU in Canberra. His work is in basic research, in medical research, and he studies viruses and immune responses to viruses. And he wants to see how exactly the immune, um, the immune system responds to the vaccines that we give to people. And finally, we have Dr. Rachel Dunlop, Rachel is a campaigner for science-based medicine in Australia with a special interest in refuting the claims of the anti-vaccination movement. In her day job, however, she is a medical researcher with an interest in motor neuron disease, in particular the role of blue-green algae in triggering, in triggering ALS. So please welcome our panel. So broad-scale vaccination has saved millions of lives worldwide, making it the most effective form of disease prevention that we have. And new vaccines and new delivery methods keep coming. So the big question is, why are vaccination rates dropping to dangerous levels, uh, particularly dangerous levels in some parts of Australia? So if we could discuss that. So uh, what are the key factors that contribute to this sort of uh, reduction in vaccination rates and why is it happening? I guess I can start commenting there on what I know from um, my experience, um, there's a There are many factors. Uh, one of them is um, has been attributed to complacency. And I guess that happens because in the Western world, at least, many of these diseases don't occur anymore. And so in many ways, they're out of mind, out of sight. So people used to be uh, very um, active about getting vaccinations um, because they would see their um, relatives with polio in calipers. They would come to school one day and their schoolmate was not there because they had measles. So in a way, vaccination is a victim of its own success because it has been so effective at eliminating these diseases that we don't see them, they're not in our faces. So we kind of get complacent. We're like, well, it's not going to happen to me. Um, that's one of the reasons. Um, I think also people are short on time these days and one of the hypotheses floating around that um, just recently there was a report that came out through the National Preventative Health Association here in Australia showing that 77,000 children in Australia are not fully vaccinated. Um, and this creates risk areas obviously for where pockets of disease can actually re reoccur. And of course we're seeing those in Australia particularly with things like pertussis or whooping cough and measles. And one of the theories behind that is why are kids not finishing the schedule? Well, perhaps their parents are busy, um, they just haven't got around to it. Um, curiously, we find these pockets of lack of vaccination in affluent areas, which are traditionally um, high income earners, highly educated people, juxtaposed with areas where you might expect people to shun vaccination, such as alternative lifestyle areas like Nimbin, Mullumbimby, the Northern Rivers region of New South Wales is one of the lowest areas for vaccination, but so is the northern and eastern suburbs of Sydney. So um, people perhaps are busy, they don't get time, they may move interstate, they don't keep up with the schedules, the schedules can change. David can um, talk about that a bit more, I think. Um, so is, there is a difference in the There is across different states schedules? if you move. Um, sometimes the exact timing of, of vaccinations is not there. And, to be perfectly blunt, moving from state to state, the way the health system changes and the way that it's administered can be different. So you can work out how you're doing it with one kid, then you move it to state, and, um, and it's somewhat different. And you've got to work it out all over again. And if you go moving, there's a whole bunch of stuff you've got to work out all the time. So things slip by. You do the things, what is it they say? They, you do things that are urgent, not necessarily the things that are important. 
And I think that's a real issue because getting the vaccinations is something that's clearly really important for your kid's health, but it's not really urgent. It's not like when your kid falls over and breaks a leg, it's urgent, you've got to go to the doctor. Doing the vaccinations is something that's important, but it's something that's put off. And is it necessary to stick to a very strict schedule of vaccination? I think the really... I mean, is it something you can pick up as you go along? Is that, is that one of the things that we I think the thing is that, that the vaccination schedule is not only... Uh, I mean, it, it's not only about making sure you, you get the right shots at the right time, but it's timed in terms of um, when the, the peak for diseases are and to make sure that kids are prepared before they start going to childcare and, and going to school. So it's more about making sure that kids are protected at the time that they're going to be vulnerable for the disease. Um, and, uh, I mean, I guess what I, what I want to say is that if kids have missed a vaccine, it's never too late to catch it up. It's <laughs> like it's, it's not that it becomes irrelevant, it's no good and you've got to start all over again or something. You, you want to get it done straight away. Um, but, um, but it's really important to observe those schedules um, just to make sure they're done. So what do you think are some of these... Uh, what, what contributes to these changing societal attitudes towards vaccination, is it, apart from complacency and not seeing the diseases? Because we're seeing such an increase in the level of um, anti-vaccination uh, promotion. Uh, there's a lot of scepticism in the community about vaccines. Where is that coming from? Well, I, I personally think it's... It's Dr. Google, actually. Um, there was a study done recently, it was rather a survey more so than a study by um, Bupa Healthcare, and they asked people to tell them how often they use the internet to research their healthcare and their medications. And about um, one in two of us is going to the internet to research our diseases. And this results in us getting the Dr. Google complex where um, they actually did a survey showing that if you put in headaches, you could get anything from food poisoning to you are going to die tomorrow. <laughs> so um, the internet has We've become a place there. where a lot of misinformation can perpetuate very quickly. Uh, and interestingly, when it comes to looking for information about vaccination on the internet, there's this very distinct um, arms of information where if, if you type in vaccination, you're more likely to get information that is uh, not accurate and possibly anti-vaccination. Uh, if you type in immunisation, you're more likely to get information that is accurate and science-based and reliable. And you might say, why is that? That's curious. Um, and it's because people that don't believe in vaccination don't believe that vaccines create immunity. So they don't create um, immunisation in people, so they don't tend to use the word immunisation. So if you, that's a tip for everyone. If you're looking for reliable information, search for immunisation, uh, not um, vaccination. But I think the media is also complicit in spreading some of the fear and um, inaccurate information that has certainly um, surfaced in the last decade. Uh, everyone, maybe some people here may be not familiar with the Wakefield, Andrew Wakefield, MMR, measles, mumps, rubella story. Does anyone here not know about that? Where um, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine was discredited by a doctor in the UK um, in 1998. Uh, and he suggested that it may be linked to autism. And given that nobody really knows yet exactly what causes autism and nobody is, knows how to cure it, this story that the vaccine is linked to autism was spread like wildfire through the media. And so that's now become, um, almost everybody here probably has heard that myth. And indeed it's not true, but once the media gets hold of it and it spreads across the internet, it's gone. And so those things can actually um, instill fear in people's minds and that can, can prevent them from going forth and getting vaccinated. I suppose there is an issue there. I mean, um, Wakefield was a doctor and uh, therefore is regarded as an expert. So how do you deal with um, these sorts of conflicting um, expert advice or seemingly conflicting advice? And well, I also use Dr Google. <laughs> so probably like most people who have access to a computer, it's a fantastic source of information. Um, but clearly one has to go looking for reputable sites. And um, uh, I think the major government health sites can be very valuable all around the world. US CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, has fantastic websites with a lot of very valuable information. So it really, it really takes looking further than the first headline. Um, because I think we, 
we probably all understand now that the internet's a wonderful place to put almost anything, and so it's a way to uh, learn a great deal about the world, but one has to look at every piece of information there with care and with a degree of scepticism and learn who to trust. So in the case of the Wakefield um, story, I mean, it's a particularly tragic one because no doubt many children died as a result of that because there was such a dramatic drop in vaccination of young children against measles, mumps and rubella as a result of the Wakefield story. Um, but science took its normal course and I investigated his claims very thoroughly and then seeing that there was such a dramatic public health effect, there were really intensive studies and review of a huge amount of data that had been collected over a long time to see whether it could possibly be true. And that's what led to the discrediting of the work and ultimately the realisation that, that this um, doctor had a very clear idea in his own mind about the, the causation of autism and effectively tried to find the data to support it. So it's important to know that the doctors and scientists can get it wrong, that they're human, that they have uh, biases and that's how the scientific and medical process has to work to try to investigate new claims and find out whether they are indeed true. And I think, can I just add something to that, Ophelia? I think it's important to note as well that he had some very serious conflicts of interest and mostly monetary, in fact. Um, he had a patent on a single measles vaccine submitted and so he was going out into the news and saying the triple antigen measles mumps rubella in triplicate is dangerous but we should split them up. And, oh, look over here what I have, a single measles vaccine. So, so who exactly was representing Big Pharma there in that controversy? <laughs> and in addition to that, he was being paid by lawyers who wanted to sue the manufacturers of the triple antigen measles mumps rubella vaccine. So he was actually developing a case to sue the manufacturers. And in addition to that, he had submitted a patent which he claimed he had a complete cure for autism. And, in fact, I didn't discover this fact until just a couple of days ago because there's a journalist from the UK by the name of Brian Deere and he was, um, he was critical in exposing the fraudulent behaviour of Andrew Wakefield. Um, but this patent that allegedly was going to describe a complete cure was absolutely bizarre. He was going to take the measles virus and inject it into mice and then extract white blood cells from mice and inject the white blood cells into pregnant goats and then extract the breast milk from the pregnant goats and put them into capsules and that would cure autism. Hmm. Now, that sounds to me like... That's a really interesting experiment that I've <laughs> never encountered before. So your usual method of, of developing a vaccine certainly doesn't happen that way. You would carry out a lot of studies in animals and then move on to higher animals as you went along, but you would never sort of exchange across species to, to that extent, I think. What do you think about that, David? You are involved in designing vaccines. I don't you? even want to go there. That's <laughs> just so bizarre. Yeah. Um, That's not even the scientific method. Yeah, no. I, <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't even know where to start with that. But what I will say, though, another thing that's, that's sort of interesting about the way we talk about science and the way it's portrayed, we really like the iconoclasts. We really like these people who stand up and say, everyone else is wrong, all the received wisdom is wrong, um, and, and actually, I've got it right. Now, the interesting thing is, there are cases where mm. this happens and the person gets it right mm. and gets it fantastically right. And so, you know, now we take antibiotics when we have stomach ulcers and... In, yes. Instead of you know Wonderful having time. these um, constant rounds of um, of medicine that just lower acid in the stomach, so you know it does happen that that there is a person who's right, and typically what happens is that over time the establishment does get it right. The, what you don't find is is situations where people have an idea that's completely outlandish, and they're out there in the wilderness forever, and that if the issue gets traction and people are studying it, eventually either they'll be shown right or wrong and what happens is things move on. And I think, again, the um, helicobacter story with stomach ulcers is a great example of that because, sure, they were in the wilderness for a long time, but eventually the science moved on, the medicine moved on, and it made a change. What's been happening with the anti-vaccination, actually, that's been going on as long as we've had vaccination. So there were people... Um, who suggested the smallpox vaccine was evil and wrong. There's these fantastic cartoons that were drawn. This uh, is the very first vaccine. The very first vaccine. So we're talking 200 vaccine. years ago. These great cartoons with um, 
uh, pictures of people with um, cows popping out of their, hmm. their their shoulders and things because you know this is what was going to happen if you had the uh, the vaccine which came from a, a virus called cowpox. So this movement has been trying to discredit immunisation now for um, two centuries, and all of the claims have been looked at carefully, and it never works out. And I think that's one way to to, to assess the information that's out there. So ask about the iconoclasts. Have they been going for 50 years? Are people actually really looking rigorously at what they're saying? And if people are looking rigorously and it looks like they're not right, chances are they're not right. Um, the great thing about science is that although individuals are flawed and individual scientists are flawed, the consensus in the method means that you go back over and over again and test what is being said, do new experiments and add that, and eventually what happens is it becomes a self-correcting um, mechanism. It becomes self-correcting over time mm. um, as more studies are, are done, which is the best bit about it. Why do you think it took so long to discredit Wakefield and uh, then sort of the media cycle of that took quite a long, as, long time as well to sort of pull back into, pull people back into vaccination? Did it take a long time? I think the um, issue has more been that the story has hung around long after it was discredited. Mm. Mm. But it's also interesting, Rachel, the stories you just told about uh, Wakefield, uh, it took a long time for all of those conflicts of interest to emerge, I think. Yes, it did, yeah. Mm. And that, uh, interestingly, that was a journalist, an investigative journalist from The Times, not another scientist. Mm. Um, and this, of course, raises issues with peer review, which, if you're not familiar with how scientific papers are published in the community, they are sent to our peers and they look over them and they make decisions about whether they should be published or not. Um, and that paper, the Wakefield paper, contained many things that should have been red flags to the people that peer reviewed it and it went through without them picking those up. And as recently as just this week, a very similar event has happened with um, a guy from the Centers for Disease Control by the name of Dr Hooker, who published a paper saying that um, autism rates in African-American males was hundreds of percentages higher um, when they'd had the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. And this was published in a very small journal, unlike the Wakefield paper, which was in a very respectable mm -hmm. me medical journal. But it got published, and it was only this week that it was this new one was retracted when it was deemed that he didn't reveal conflicts of interest and he'd used statistical methods that were dodgy. But for a very long time, this hashtag was going around called CDC whistleblower, saying this one maverick doctor, like David Heddle has said, has come out now and he's exposed the entire Centers for Disease Control for hiding this, that autism is linked to this vaccine for decades. And of course, you must exercise skepticism in that case. And it only took about two weeks for his paper to be pulled. Mm. But you know, the horse has bolted once again and it's here we go with the media cycle again and even last week on the news in channel nine they covered this and to someone who's a scientist and i can look at that and go well clearly that's nonsense but the public doesn't have the ability to determine why those statistics are wrong where are these conflicts of interest so once these things get out into the public it's very difficult to bring them back and i like to refer to it as like ringing a bell once you've rung a bell in people's minds you can't unring it and once you scare people into thinking that um, a vaccine is linked to autism, that will always be in their thoughts and you can never remove that from their thinking. And it's sort of difficult to convey um, the nature of the scientific method in a, small, in a short uh, news report as well and how it will eventually self-correct or why you'd look at, it, at an epidemiological study and it's very defined in its parameters, but when you're reporting that information, you're not necessarily going to talk about those um, issues. So I guess the question is, are there any toxic components in, 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 vac in vaccines, as people who have actually worked on vaccines? Well, it depends on what you call a toxin, but I mean, diphtheria toxin is a vaccine, isn't it? Um, but the, um, if we mean toxic in the, the sense that it's something that's there specifically to hurt the person mm -hmm. who receives it, then no, of course, vaccines are tested uh, developed and tested extremely thoroughly to avoid uh, having components which would cause damage in the person. Um, it's a very complex area because we know that with some vaccines, with every vaccine in a tiny number of people, there'll be adverse events which are, are undesirable. And we'd love to get to the day when no vaccine would uh, ever cause an adverse event in any person. Um, 
and that we will be able to identify the people who might be more prone to having an adverse event with a vaccine than, than we currently can today. So it's a, a very important area. Uh, and so as in um, with any drug or vaccine, you need always to be making that balance between benefit and the risk. So when uh, vaccines are developed, there's this, as uh, we've already discussed, there's this extensive testing that starts with an idea in the lab through to uh, testing in animals, through to um, uh, ultimately testing in a very small number of humans, and then finally larger scale trials. And of course, the very first thing that everybody's looking for in those experiments in humans is safety. It's the very first thing. The first trials are designed entirely to find out whether the new product, vaccine or, or drug is safe. And it's only when it's shown to be safe that the work continues to find out how well it works. Um, it's uh, actually so a really good point because I was having a conversation with actually my mum over what I did because uh, <laughs> one of the viruses I worked with is the cold sore virus and um, there was a thing in the paper saying that there was great hope there was this vaccine um, for the herpes simplex virus, which causes cold sores. And she wanted to know if that had anything to do with what I did. And I said, um, well, no, not really, but um, I'm really curious about this new vaccine. So I had a look. And in, in fact, what had happened is it had just passed what we call phase one clinical trial. The way that it was reported, though, was that this was a vaccine that was showing great hope, presumably, to protect. But the reality was that the trial that had just been passed was one of these phase one trials, and really all they were saying was this thing is safe. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really important that everyone understands that that, that, that that is the first thing we do when we, when we test drugs. And everyone gets terribly excited when a drug passes this trial. Yeah. Um, obviously, if something looks like it might not be great to put into people, or even if um, they feel rotten for a little while, it's probably going to be the end of that drug or that yes. vaccine. Um, but it doesn't necessarily yet mean that it works. There's an awful lot more work that's got to be done. But you don't even go to do the large trials required to see if it's going to work mm. unless it passes this first safety hurdle. And the standards have got higher and higher. And I remember hearing um, Peter Andrews, who's more recently been the chief scientist in Queensland, saying that if we set the standards that we have today when aspirin was first introduced, it would never have passed. And that's because... <laughs> In a small number of people with uh, use of aspirin, you'll get a little bit of bleeding in the stomach. Now, aspirin is one of the most successful drugs we have. It's tremendously useful. We've all used it, I'm sure. Um, and uh, yet, we wouldn't have that as uh, one of our basic drugs um, if we set the extremely high standards we have today for not causing side effects. So yeah. it's a very, very difficult balance. Mm -hmm. And it's a balance that's set particularly high for vaccines because they go into healthy people. With some drugs, if they're for somebody who's being treated with a very serious, for a very serious illness and perhaps a terminal illness, then you'll tolerate toxicity that you would never consider in a healthy person because it's so important to give the person a chance of survival and you know that their chances are very low otherwise. But when it comes to vaccines that are for healthy people and particularly for children, then the barriers have to be extremely high because nobody wants to do harm. Hmm. Yeah, I think there's also a different definition of toxin on Dr. Google, Anne, that you might be familiar with, which involves taking the inserts from vaccines and then breaking down the individual chemicals and looking up the worst case scenario, the scariest thing you can find, like mercury, for example. Yeah, um, yeah I think that's what I was thinking of. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, yeah, no, I really, I really like that mercury. because, because the, where mercury comes in is, is that it's a compound of mercury, right, and thimerosal. Mm. So it's not actually mercury, mercury. itself. Mm. And I saw a great cartoon somewhere. Um, it, it, was, it was a riposte to an anti-vax cartoon where they showed um, this guy wearing incredible amount of um, a protective stuff, handling mercury, saying, you know, this is how I handle mercury in the lab. And then underneath he says, but when it's in a vaccine, I feel perfectly safe. Mm. But then, and so there was an anti-vaccination. Underneath it was somebody um, kitted up similarly, handling chlorine. This is how I handle chlorine in the lab. And then there's someone putting um, salt on their chips. <laughs> yeah. Curiously, when I use um, table salt, I feel perfectly safe. Yeah. The, the, the point yeah. is that, that you have to be very careful um, 
about the claims and about things that are said. Mm. So, you know, a compound is not the same as an element. Things that sound the same, things can sound incredibly similar, but it doesn't make them the same. Um, Don't forget that you can drown in water. Yeah, yeah. that's right. <laughs> and, and I think also, further to your point, David, is that the poison is in the dose. Yep. So, yes, exactly. for example, exactly. um, anti-vaxxers like to pick on formaldehyde, which is a chemical that our body actually makes anyway. It is in some vaccines, but also there's more of it in a pear that you would eat than there is in a vaccine. Um, so the levels of these chemicals or toxins that are in vaccines are there for a reason, and they're at low, no, low enough levels that they're not going to cause toxicity in people. But like Anne said, I mean, just recently, I don't know if you guys saw this, there was an article in the paper about a woman who went on a detox diet and she drank five litres of water in a day and she ended up in ICU for three weeks or something mm. because she completely flooded her system with water and then all her um, electrolytes were out of balance and she ended up in a coma. So yeah. water can also be very toxic in high doses. So, so a it's very much about, diet. Yeah, <laughs> it's about the dose is in the, the... The poison is in the dose, you know. I mean, there's cyanide in apple cores, um, in little apple seeds or in um, apricot yes, seeds. Apricots, but Beaches we're not all apricots. dying mm. because, you know, we're not taking a big enough dose of it. Yeah. Well, I guess um, that's an important point, that these ideas of toxicity, uh, we don't have very clear ideas of what these chemicals do or why they're there. Um, and these ideas also persist in the community. So we already have this notion of, you know, autism is vaccines cause autism or we will be at risk in some way. So why do these ideas persist? Where, you know, where do, we, where do they come from? How do we get rid of them, I think, is the main thing. How do we communicate to people, um, convince people or address the concerns that people have about vaccines? Well, I think it's very hard because they are tenacious and I think with, particularly with vaccine-preventable diseases, as I said before, we don't see them in front of our faces anymore. Um, and unfortunately, one of the best ways is to tell stories about people that have been affected by vaccine preventable diseases to emphasize how important it is to be protected. Um, and this is not always nice to do that. It's difficult to get people to speak out about it as well. But there are some very brave parents in Australia who have done that in the last few years. Um, and in, also a, a couple in New Zealand whose seven year old contracted tetanus and was um, in hospital for 12 months and had to learn to walk again and eat again and because they had decided that there were too many toxins in the vaccine. But then he got tetanus and that was a lot worse. Um, and, you know, I've spoken to people who talk about how in, um, in court cases people come out with their children and say they're, they're vaccine injured. But there's also the other side, which is children are injured from vaccine-preventable diseases. And maybe this is the way that we can convey to them it's very important to remember you need to get vaccinated. What do you guys think? I, I think that's true. I think we, we all understand um, stories that we can relate to our own lives, whether we're scientists or doctors or, or any other profession or person. We understand those stories much more acutely, and I think it is a good approach to take. I think also the anti-vaccination lobby itself uses stories as a very powerful way to um, explain their position. So it is a, it's a very, um, I think, a successful way to present a counter view. What's much harder to talk about is um, odds. And yet everybody, mm. oh, we're a gambling country. <laughs> we will understand about odds at the race, races, but we don't always understand or, or project that very well into thinking about the odds of infectious disease and the types of um, illnesses and damage we could experience in our own lives if we didn't have vaccines. And so, of course, the anti-vaccination lobby naturally is going to focus on the negative effects of vaccines, those rare adverse events. Uh, and it's easy to do that if you live in a community where, as you said before, um, you're not often seeing people who are exposed to um, the traumas of infectious disease. But Smallpox has been eliminated, but it's only a few decades ago. Mm. The last natural case was in 1977, but that was a that was an infectious disease that shaped the world's population. It was an absolutely devastating disease. It's killed very many people and scarred others for their lives. And we can easily forget that it's in a way one of the greatest triumphs of human science and medicine that that awful disease has been completely eliminated from the face of the earth by vaccination. It wouldn't have gone any other way. WHO is trying to do the same for polio and it's really hard. 
um, because there are still countries which are not allowing the polio vaccinators in and um, so there are some pockets still where polio can spread. It means now that somebody from one of those countries could bring polio back into this country. Uh, so we have, we're now in a globalised community where we need to pay attention to the whole world of, um, of vaccination issues and, and I think take advantage of our own access to vaccines to make sure we are protected from those that, even those that we don't see in our own community anymore. I but think that's a really important point, Anne, because in 2011, which was only, what, three years ago, three and a half years ago, um, a 22-year-old woman in Brisbane died from diphtheria. Now, who's ever heard of diphtheria anymore? I, had, I got rang, rung up by someone in the media to say, can you talk about this death? And I had to Google it because I was like, oh, do we still have diphtheria? <laughs> and what had happened there was she hadn't been vaccinated as a child and her friend went overseas and brought it back into the country and she caught it from him when he'd been travelling around. So most cases these days of vaccine-preventable diseases are coming in, they're imported. And of course we're seeing that with Ebola in, in yeah. America now and, and there was a scare in Brisbane a couple of weeks ago um, and, and the UK has had a scare. Because people get on planes, you can be anywhere within you know, a very short time. Yes. But I think that's another thing to, to bring up. We, we seem to have a... Um, somewhat opposing view. So on the, on the one hand, there are all these childhood illnesses which used to be a real plague on our communities, which everybody knew, polio um, um, in particular was something feared. Again, I could bring up my mum again. She was sent to the country. She lived in, in Adelaide. Um, she's now in her mid-80s. And she was sent out to the country for um, half a year to go live with some people who were acquaintances because they were so afraid of, of polio. Mm -hmm. We don't see it anymore. But then when we see images in Africa of an Ebola outbreak, people are horrified. Mm. You know, and, and we talk about the death rate from Ebola and people are horrified. Smallpox was like that. And smallpox was with us all the time. But we got rid of it with vaccination. But then interestingly, measles is more um, scary really than Ebola because it's more... Um, virulent and you can catch it from sitting next to someone on a plane and it's airborne and so people aren't really scared of measles that much and they probably no. should be. There was a UK band called the measles. <laughs> oh, really? It was. They, they called themselves the measles because they wanted to be really catchy. Oh. Yeah, so that's, that's, is that a scientist yeah. joke statement? No, no. I, I, I have to admit that when I do my med school lectures, sometimes I Google yeah. and it's amazing what you find. But there's um, another very sad thing about measles and that we've just talked about people mm. coming from other countries into our own and potentially bringing um, vaccine preventable diseases. But we've been doing the reverse and uh, so... There's uh, a lot of measles vaccination now in many countries of the world because it is a beautifully vaccine-preventable disease. It is really the next on the list after polio to try to eliminate from the, from the whole world because there's no animal reservoir and the vaccine is great. But because we have pockets in our community now where people are not vaccinated against measles by, by their personal choice, it's now happened that people from Western countries have taken measles into developing countries. Mm. Um, and that, I mean, that's a, a tragedy. We're, we're tending to think of it only from our own point of view of being safe from the rest of the world. But it seems in this case we're a danger to others if we don't um, look after our own immunity. Well, that's really interesting. I think that there is definitely a strong perception that some diseases are not going to bother us anymore, at least in Western countries, and that other diseases, uh, infectious diseases, that are a worry because it's about it's about being unsanitary, it's about a uh, lack of hygiene. But in a world where there's increasing antibiotic resistance and, and fewer treatments, and we need to develop more drugs and treatments, uh, do you think that immunisation uh, and more vaccines will be the way to go? Will they become increasingly important, or just as part of the arsenal of well, public I think, health I, I, I approaches? Mean, I think vaccines are the best way to go if you can make a good one, um, because antibiotics, antiviral drugs, these are all treating the event after it's happened, uh, and uh, they have their own problems. But if we can prevent the d disease spreading in the first place, if we can stop ourselves from catching these diseases. This is far more cost effective. It's far more pleasant for us as individuals. Uh, and um, it's just the way to go. So um, I, I think um, the more vaccines, the better, as long as they're good enough. Um, but of course, that's a, that's a, a challenge when we do have um, more and more people concerned about having vaccines. And greater movements of people across the globe rapidly. Yeah, so. yeah, that's right. And you know, we've got vaccines for for the stuff that's fairly easy to make vaccines. 
that's what we've got vaccines. But there's stuff that is really tough for, for a whole bunch of reasons. You know, think of HIV AIDS, um, malaria, tuberculosis. These are you know, major killers around the world. But that just turns out that the nature of the biology of those viruses means that it's an awful lot harder to make a decent vaccine that's going to work. Um, and again, it's one of those really strange juxtapositions that on the one hand, we have lobby groups saying that we should stop doing vaccination. And on the other hand, we've got a very um, vocal HIV lobby group and who, who are, are looking you know, to the health of people who've got HIV and AIDS, saying, yeah. why don't we have a vaccine? Why won't the scientists work harder? Mm. You know, they've got vaccines for everything else. Yeah. So sometimes you can feel a little bit like the meat in the sandwich, I guess, if your business is science, because <laughs> everyone has their point of view. Um, but you're trying to just go down and follow the path and, and work out what's what and try. Uh, you know, genuinely, most people in science, I, nearly everyone I know, um, people aren't doing it for their own satisfaction. They're doing it because they want an outcome that's better for people. Malaria is another really interesting mm. challenge, and Australia has been at the forefront of trying to develop malaria vaccines for a long, long time. And, of course, that's not because malaria is a big problem in Australia, except for returned travellers sometimes. Um, but it's really because it's such a global killer, one of the big three, along with TB and HIV. And like HIV, it's just turned out to be really hard to make a vaccine that's effective because the parasite changes so much. It can so easily avoid the immunity that's induced by a vaccine. Same with HIV. It has all sorts of tricks to avoid being, um, to being targeted by a vaccine. So there are hard ones. They're quite difficult, but I think every year we also have a different flu vaccine. So do you think that's something that would arise for these sorts of diseases? I mean, it would be incredibly expensive to do, though. That would be the problem, to come up with a new one well, to I address Well, I think them. the difficulty, too, is that with HIV, it's a chronic infection, so any one patient can have many different versions of the HIV virus um, circulating in, in that person, whereas flu viruses tend to just keep moving forward globally. It's not that each of us with a flu infection is uh, incubating our own uh, new strain. It's that uh, the strains at a global level are moving ahead year by year, so we can actually almost keep up with them with the vaccine. But flu sits somewhere between um, the difficult ones like HIV mm. and malaria and the, the really effective, simple vaccines like, um, well, for the most part, polio and measles. Um, and be precisely because flu viruses do change from year to year and we do have to update the vaccine and if the um, viruses change a little bit more in the time between deciding what to put in the vaccine and actually producing enough to roll out to deliver to people, then you'll have a slightly less effective vaccine. So flu vaccines are a real challenge. Even though they're not perfect vaccines, they um, have a huge impact in reducing illness in the community, reducing hospitalisation from flu, reducing deaths from flu, uh, but we'd still like them to be better still. Absolutely. Um, I guess the, the final question is really around um, how do we com combat these sort of negative attitudes in the community or how do we inform people? What will, who should people talk to if they want to find out more about uh, immunisation? What are the sources that they can trust, apart from Dr Google, since they need to go for that all the time? <laughs> Most people's own doctor is, yeah. a, is a good source of wise information based on a lot of experience and a lot of reading. Um, there will still be some doctors who themselves are uh, not particularly in favour of vaccination, but I was interested to read some data from Western Australia where they're really having a big push. Again, this is flu because it's my, my own subject. Um, but they, we know that influenza is particularly serious in pregnant women. Uh, it's much more likely to lead to hospitalisation, can lead to the death of the baby and, and sometimes the death of the mother. And um, in Western Australia, they've been trying to promote more vaccination of pregnant women. Um, and it's been running at about 23% or so. But they did a, a study where they had a big push, and particularly through GPs and, um, and I guess, um, obstetricians to try to promote influenza vaccination for pregnant women. And they found that um, the recommendation of the clinician increased, had a tenfold uh, impact on people's willingness to have the flu vaccination during pregnancy. You know, women are naturally worried about what drugs and vaccines they take during pregnancy. And so having that recommendation from the doctor, who could then point out that the risks of getting flu were very substantial for them, uh, really made a difference. 
So my own view is that a trusted doctor is a very important person and we also need to make sure that doctors have at their fingertips yeah, the, the information, information they need yeah. to, to yeah. make, um, to give wise advice to somebody according to their specific condition. Yeah, I think I absolutely agree with you, Anne. And also, um, there is also some evidence that shows that people get a lot of their health information from their social circle as well. So they will ask their friends and family for advice before they'll ask their doctor in some, um, occasion, on some occasions. Um, there's a group of people who are friends of mine who are working in the Northern Rivers region of New South Wales and they're just a community group, they're unfunded. Um, in the Northern Rivers region, which is Malambimbi Nimbin, the vaccination rate is amongst the lowest in the country. And so they're just making flyers, they're talking to people at community meetings, at schools, just getting the message out amongst the community and they're finding that that's become a um, very effective way of conveying information because they're, they're, they're talking to their friends and they're in an environment where people feel safe. There's also tends to be in areas like that a distrust of authority and of doctors. Mm. Um, so to actually just go to a barbecue and have a chat with a friend um, they find is um, beneficial. And we find also that on social media, there's a lot of a lot of people head to social media these days to find information. So I'm actually an administrator of a Facebook group called Stop the Australian Vaccination Network, um, where we try to refute um, misinformation or uh, incorrect information about vaccination and answer people's questions, because many people um, are just confused and they do Google vaccination and they find the number one website in the country is an anti-vaccination website if you Google vaccination. So they just want e explanations for things. There's only about 2% of the population in, in Australia that absolutely refuse to vaccinate, but there's something like 10 to 30% that just want more information. Mm -hmm. So we try to just get out there and provide information, write blogs, get on to social media, um, answer people's questions and then they can make up their own mind from there. Okay, well, um, maybe just one, one last question before we uh, go to questions from the audience, uh, which is basically, what is the future of immunisation? I think we'll be moving on from terrifying needles uh, to different <laughs> delivery methods. So what's the, what does it look like for vaccines in the future? There's so much interesting research mm. going on, how to deliver vaccines in a way that um, achieves two things. First of all, is more acceptable to the patient, uh, and particularly when we're thinking about children who can be hard to vaccinate. Um, but is also more effective for inducing strong immunity. So learning the best ways to deliver a vaccine so that it gets exactly the right sort of immune response to protect us when the, the real bug comes along. So those two things together are leading to a lot of research on patches and uh, little um, pads with tiny little needles that you hardly feel on them and uh, um, oral vaccines, um, nasal Vaccines, and sprays as well. Sprays. I think the other thing that's driving that is that there's much more multidisciplinary medical research happening now. So exactly. you know that these so-called nano patches. It's because there is um, physicists and engineers mm. who are getting involved in doing this. You know, typically in the past, these people have been. You know, it's the hard. It's the the medical. The um, things like pacemakers and those sorts of things. They haven't been bringing that type of science to things like vaccination, sort of, I don't know, drugs and wet biology, if that makes sense. But I think this has been a really big move in medicine and we're seeing more and more of it. So as we start merging these technologies, we have much more ability to do these things, to get past old fashioned things like needles. Let's face it, needles are pretty old fashioned. <laughs> Excellent. Well, um, thank you very much to our panellists. Um, this, is, this just sort of ends the formal part of the uh, evening. So we would like to open uh, to questions from the audience. There are two ushers on either side of the room. So if you do have a question, please put your hand up and they will come to you with a microphone. And if you can, um, stick to questions and not statements. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I was just... Did I need to stand up? Or? Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. So um, I just want to know whether uh, Wakefield offered any explanation or uh, rationale for his very bizarre experiment starting with mice and ending in sheep or whatever it was that you explained just a second <laughs> ago. Uh, just that was just a question. Did he offer any explanation? Uh, no, I only saw that patent um, over the weekend on the Brian Deere show that was actually made in 2004. He just Brian Deere just put it on YouTube um, a couple of days ago. But the, Brian Deere took it to another immunologist who was also on the patent 
who's now living in um, South Carolina, I think, and he asked him to explain it and he just said, it's gibberish, I don't know. So I, I really don't understand it because apparently the Royal Free Hospital in London, this eminent immunologist who's now retired, but he is a little bit weird because he had some funny ideas about injecting his own bone marrow cells into children with autism and that was going to cure it. And then Wakefield were on this patent and it was this m m just colostrum from pregnant goats that they were going to put into tablets. And to me that sounds like the ultimate quackery. So it doesn't make any sense at all. It's word salad, isn't it? It's like, let's put some words in a hat and we'll make a patent. But Did he write a grant for that? Was there a grant involved? I don't that? know if there was a grant involved, but there was a patent lodged with the London Patent Office, which is embarrassing enough, I think. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I receive a daily email from the conversation, which is a consortium of Australian universities, and when you click on the link, they have a disclosure statement whether the person's receiving or not receiving funding or has financial interest. When um, researchers submit their papers to journals, um, and reputable journals, um, are they um, asked to make a disclosure statement? Um, yeah, could you yes. tell me what the sort of yeah. Yeah, and general it, consensus is? It's interesting. That's something that's become much more prominent in the last few years because of these yeah. sorts of terrible stories. And so now all of us, whenever we submit a paper to a journal, national, international journal, whatever it is, there are quite detailed uh, forms we need to fill in where we disclose every kind of interest we might have. And they might be personal financial interests, they might be whether we've ever been paid by a drug company to do anything or receive research funds from a drug company. There's a whole range of different questions we're asked. Now, of course, you can't rely on everybody to fill those things in honestly, but I think the great majority of people will because we understand that uh, full disclosure is much better than being caught out. Um, and so I think that's just something that's become much, much better over the last few years. So the conversation does it, as you say, uh, but all the journals do it now as well. It is interesting. In some fields, it's, it's almost impossible to see papers published where someone isn't declaring a conflict of interest because most of the top clinicians are in great demand. Um, the companies will want to have them testing their products um, or if a great product is, uh, a great new drug is out there, um, quite often the clinicians are very excited about it. They, they can be quite evangelical and it's not that they have interest in the in, in the company or they may have been involved with the company in the past, but they're really happy for the improvement that they see in their patients. Yeah. In fact, I think we, we need to not suggest that there should be no interaction between scientists and doctors and companies or we won't get good products out of, out of the end. It's a matter of being completely open about what yeah. those relationships are. Yeah, I think um, one of the recent issues that's starting to become a problem is um, open access journals is becoming a big thing these days and that's where you pay money to get your work published and that's resulted in the rise of what's been known as predatory journals so all these journals that you know when we talk about um, journals we, we generally rank them in terms of their impact factors so at the top would be the Lancet for example so if you get published in Nature and the Lancet you've made the top but at the bottom, there's a whole bunch of little tiny journals that may have only formed last week, and they'll publish your work for a fee, and they might not even read it. So you end up with a whole lot of junk that's polluting the um, publications, and that's becoming increasingly a problem. So it's even, more, it's even difficult for us as scientists who are used to reading journal articles to determine which ones are okay. So for anyone else, it's becoming much more difficult. Um, thank you very much to all four of you because I think the fact that you're here having this discussion goes a long way to getting over the sorts of issues we're all here to hear about. I'm going to ask two things. One of them is going to make me unpopular. Um, the first thing is you've outlined really clearly how complicated it is changing people's views about stuff, especially when they're things that are sort of personal things like this. Do you think we need a massive advertising campaign, a sort of shock and awe? Here is the child dying from this preventable disease, number one. Number two, the one that's going to get me in trouble. Do you think there's a sort of scientific arrogance which means that sometimes these sorts of issues don't get discussed enough and that contributes to the problems we're seeing? Yeah, can I respond to the second question first? Um, yes, I do. I do think there's... I wouldn't necessarily call it scientific arrogance. I would call it um, just the old school 
ivory tower academics that the way you used to go through an academic career was you were you would teach and you would publish and you would not speak to the public <coughs> that was not part of your job increasingly it's becoming important to do public speaking and to go and talk about your work to the public to the point now where grant agencies are asking you to demonstrate if i give you two hundred thousand dollars how are you going to tell people about it now my opinion is that we are obliged to do that all my research money comes from charity funding so if I don't tell people what I'm doing, then why should they give me money? And I think we can't blame the government for taking away funding um, when, if we don't talk about what we're doing. How do people know if we're doing important work if we don't talk about it? The problem as it stands is that there's quite a lot of pushback in the current system and there's no rewards for doing public speaking or science communication. So that will change and it will have to change. Increasingly, as our funding dries up, and we need to find different ways to find money, we're going to be forced out of our labs and out of our offices to talk about things. But for a long time, it's just been the old school academics that have gone along that path and thought, well, I don't need to talk about this stuff. But yes, I agree with you, and I think that is a big problem, and it's going to have to change very soon. That's, that's how things are moving. Um, it, it's not good enough anymore just to talk to the scientific community. No. Um, you do have to communicate more broad, broadly. Um, I, I think also, though, there's this idea that perhaps maybe wasn't so much, but we're all in, we all live in communities, and um, and that means that you meet other parents of kids at school, and um, and that can be quite challenging um, if people have different opinions <laughs> to you. Um, how are you going to go about that? And I know that's that's an, an issue that that I face and other people face. Um, maybe I get around it some way by um, going into the primary school and speaking to the kids instead of their parents. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but actually, I think that's a really useful thing to do as well, is to, is, is to get and, and to speak to kids. Kids are really excited about the natural world. They want to know what's yeah. going on. And they're not stupid. They can think about things for themselves as well. So I think that's a great way to start the conversation. It, it's not, you know, you don't have to sit down and do formal things. Anything that you do to talk about the issues is, is really helpful. And, and often there's a lot of, you know, so we're talking about immunisation, but just talking about the way that we approach science and think about science can be useful. Talking about issues like relative risk, the odds of things. I mean, one of, the, one of my favourite examples is that the most risky thing about getting your kid vaccinated is driving your child to the doctor. <laughs> it is, order, it is, you know, a, a, a thousandfold. M much more than a thousandfold, more risky. You're more likely to damage your child by driving them to the doctor yeah. than actually getting the vaccine. But, you know, it's really important that, that we communicate these things as often as we can. So I just to... Sorry, Rachel, just oh, to go sorry. to the first question the first as well. Question, oh, like, that's a killer. Do, we, yeah. do we need to have a, a mass education campaign? Do we need to have an advertising campaign to combat Well, I this? mean, it's being done in certain parts of Australia. Um, there's a group in WA that are running a campaign called I Immunise, and it's, um, it's targeting crunchy mums, as they call it. So um, they're saying it's okay to use cloth nappies, it's okay to um, uh, homeschool, but it's also, okay, it's also okay to vaccinate. It doesn't have to, you don't have to be the all-encompassing Western medicine person to vaccinate. You can also, you know, just um, use homeopathy, use cloth nappies and vaccinate. That's cool too. <laughs> And that's been very successful in WA. As I mentioned before, there's the um, Northern Rivers Vaccine Supporters Group in Mullumbimby and Nimbin. They're working to do grassroots stuff. And the group I work with, Stop the Australian Vaccination Network, we're doing grassroots stuff as well. And that has been very successful, our campaign particularly, in educating the media about how to deal with issues surrounding science and medicine, in particular vaccination. Um, because there's this phenomenon with the media where they're um, obsessed with doing balance in stories. So every story has to have balance. And, no, and normally that's a good thing. If you're going to talk about, well, are the Rabbitohs better or hang on Hawthorne versus <laughs> who's the other football team? I'm from Sydney, I don't know. Um, I don't know. You know <laughs> then you would get two people head to head and you'd argue until you run out of time. But when it comes to science and medicine, you know, the, the evidence that vaccination is beneficial and safer than getting the disease is 99.9999%. And that, it's, that there are adverse events is 0 0.0111. So why would you put two people on TV and give them 50% of the time to argue that vaccines are bad? So 
we've spent a lot of time trying to emphasise and reach out to media to say, look, you don't need to do this. You can talk to a mum who's had a child that got a vaccine preventable disease. You can talk to an epidemiologist, an immunologist, but you don't need to get on someone who, um, if you're doing a story about going to land on the moon, you don't talk to a moon landing denier. The same as you wouldn't talk to a Holocaust denier if you're doing a story on the Holocaust. You just wouldn't do that. So why do that with science and medicine? And I think that has been very successful um, because evidence shows that when you do stories that are, that term for that, to describe that is false balance. When you do stories like that, particularly with respect to vaccination, people believe that there is a real argument amongst experts that this thing is actually might not be safe. Um, so it's better to just put those, to have those opinions expressed, but not in that format. So I think grassroots is, I think, the place to start. I don't, I don't know that a big advertising campaign would work because people would just be suspicious that it's big pharma funded and the government did it, and it's mm. all part of the conspiracy. The shock, maybe? yeah, the shock and awe thing. I don't think would work necessarily. Yeah. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, it worked fantastically well at the start of the HIV e epidemic mm. with the whole Grim Reaper thing. Well, actually, um, it didn't work well. Did it not work well? No. Everyone says it worked well. Well, um, my information is that it backfired because people became very frightened then of people that were HIV positive and anyone that... It, you remember people were scared of spoons, that people yeah. had to sting on toilet seats that someone may have sat on? Because Simon Reynolds wrote that campaign mm. and I knew him at the time and that made him a millionaire. He was 21 when he wrote that. But as far as I'm aware, that wasn't as successful as it could have been because it just made people more fearful of those people that had HIV. But I think that internationally it was seen as having been very effective in slowing down the epidemic in Australia. And so it may not have mm. been the best campaign that it could have, Possibly, but it actually yeah. did have a very yeah. big impact. Yeah. Yeah. In Australia. terms of the social impacts, maybe yeah. not. But that's Possibly, what I, that's what I thought yeah. too. In terms of actually the way that the epidemic spread here compared to how it was, people felt that yeah. that, that was that was well done. But but I think perhaps what this illustrates is the difficulty of shock and awe. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> that, that it's really easy to get that wrong and to have it backfire. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's uh, you know potent messages have to be held handled exceptionally carefully. It's very nuanced, I think. Yeah, it's complicated. Right. Okay. It's complicated, like all science. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, we're actually out of time at the moment, so I'm sorry if you couldn't ask your question. Um, I'd just like to thank our three panellists uh, for this evening, Professor Anne Kelso, uh, Professor David Sharkey, and Dr Rachel Dunlop, um, and to also thank our industry partners for supporting uh, this event tonight, uh, Inspiring Australia program from the, the Federal Department of Industry, uh, Science and Technology Australia, and of course the Wheeler Centre. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you.